everyone, this is Cliff Beach. Welcome back to Deeper Grooves, Musicians on Music, sponsored by California Soul Music Record Label. Man, I used to go Friday nights in Little Ethiopia and check out one of the hottest jams, Funky Fridays, that was done by bassist Lonnie Marshall, who we get to talk to today. He's here to talk about his band Weapon of Choice and some of his new Mega Nut singles that he's been dropping this year in 2020. Please help me welcome Lonnie Marshall. Cliff, how you doing? I'm good, Lonnie. How are you? I'm doing well, sir. Thank you. Yeah, man. It's excellent to be able to talk to you again. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Where, what part of, uh, where are you at located? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm near Culver City. Where are you? Uh, I'm in Hollywood, right in the middle of it. <laughs> Hollywood, I love it. Yeah. yeah but you're, uh, you're, you're a native to LA. You're born and raised here, correct? Yes, sir. South Central LA. Uh, nice man. Well, super excited to have you on podcast Deeper Groove today. Uh, it'll be real uh, nonchalant, real informal, just kind of giving you really an outlet to speak about whatever you want to talk about. We're gonna talk about uh, some of your albums, stuff, weapon of tourist stuff you've done outside of there. Uh, really, just to kind of get people excited and inspired about having such a long history. I think anyone that can last in music as long as uh, people like yourself is, is a testament to having true grit and perseverance because I know that it's not easy. Oh, thank you, brother. I appreciate you. And it's because of people like you that keep people like me going and inspired, you know. So I'm always um, inspired by my surroundings and uh, not not even necessarily musicians, but especially musicians, but just people in general. Nice. So let's get into it then. I wanted to chat with you about your last record, Really Relevant. Uh, thanks for sending that stuff over to me. I've been checking it out. As well as some new singles that you've been hitting me up with that have been amazing, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But your mixture of rock and alternative music, funk, hip-hop, jazz, reggae, you coined the term of music genre style nutmeg. Uh, people say it's likened to P-Funk, who I know is a big influence for you. And that was your sixth studio album. So how did it come together? And what was your process? I saw that you had Norwood, who you worked with, uh, with Trula de Gracias from Fishbone. And you had George Clinton from P-Funk also uh, guest on it. So I just wanted to kind of hear your take on how you were creating that album. On uh, Really Relevant, that was uh, – that was- Recorded in 2017, no, 15, I think. I'm not sure, but uh, somewhere around there. And um, I pretty much initiated sessions with different people. Like I, I recorded a couple of the tracks on Really Relevant uh, with a drummer in Texas, Houston, Texas. I was doing some sessions out there. So I would just do uh, sessions around with uh, different people, and I have a studio set up at my place, so some people come by my place and record uh, vocals and stuff, but I I do all the editing and uh, everything here, and uh, I was doing sessions with George at the time. I was getting him uh, sessions when he was in town, so he actually did did some record we did some recording together and uh that was one of the songs on there i think it's called dog i don't know if i can say that or not no, you can you can <laughs> yeah, however you want <laughs> yeah and then uh norwood i've been knowing for uh, a very long time so you know he's he's always uh in the realm uh elizabeth lee who's been playing trombone with weapon of choice in the most recent years, is on there singing and playing as well. And the actual first song that I ever wrote, when I first started playing bass, the first song I wrote was a riff, and the riff was Headspace. So that that's the um, song I'm really relevant. That was my fir- the first riff I ever wrote when I first started playing a long time ago. How did you get into actually playing bass? I know you mentioned that you're originally from South Central LA, and you got exposed very early to P Funk. I believe you had a friend whose father works for them. Is that correct? And yeah, sir. In music at LA City College. So how did you get into playing bass? 
Um, well, I, I got into playing bass because when I was in, uh, I was always drawn to the bass. And um, uh, when I heard Larry Graham, you know, dance to the music and uh, a lot of the Motown stuff, when I that's when I was growing up, I heard people playing with real vinyl, which has that heart, it connects to the heart chakra. So it was like really making an impact and imprint on me, everything that I heard. My dad used to play the 45s over and over again. So I began to uh, be able to hear and distinguish the instruments from each other, you know, and arrangements and, and stuff like that. I, be, I began to absorb it without knowing what it was, you know, and just because I heard it on repetition so much. And the bass, I was really drawn to. So um, I actually... Um, play guitar in a recital at a, in, my, in elementary. I think I was in third, third grade or something like that. Played King of the Road on guitar. Learned a couple of chords, like three chords, but I didn't have, I used the school's guitar. I didn't have my own guitar. When I finally got a uh, guitar, I, I played the low strings, uh, the four low strings. Um, but what really impacted me to actually get a bass was, like you said, I, uh, a friend of my brother's and mine's dad worked with P Funk, and uh, this was uh, at their their, their uh, a big heyday for them. We were blessed with the opportunity of being in that that environment with them. Like we got a chance to go around in limos with Bootsy and P-Funk. And we went to the Magic Castle, me and my brothers and a couple other people from middle school. This was, I was about like 12 or, or uh, 13, somewhere around there. So we got a chance to go around. We got a chance with them and we got a chance to go to the LA Funk Festival with Rick James, who, who I was into, and Confunction. Barquets, Brides of Funkenstein, Parliament, Funkadelic, Bootsy, uh, Parlette, all, all at the uh, funk festival. We got a chance to go backstage. like, And so for me to be able to experience that, and I was like, wow. And then, then we got a chance to go. We were part of a group called Boot Camp, which was Bootsy. Uh, we were youngsters that Bootsy would take photos for uh, teen magazines like Ride On Magazine at the time. So we were in, we wore a red uh, boot camp t-shirt, but we were like kind of like sidekick uh, type, uh, youth represented group for Bootsy and uh, with Bootsy. And we went on stage with Bootsy at the Funk Festival. And that like, really, I was like, wow, I think I want to do this. I actually got a chance to uh, pluck Bootsy's E string. I saw his bass in the trailer backstage. So um, I thought it was going to sound like the record, you, you know, like uh, with the wah and the mutron on it. I thought it was going to sound like that. It wasn't plugged in. Um, but yet, yeah, after that, I was like, I became, uh, I was, yeah, I was like, I want to do this. And I, I want to play to uh, write my own music, you know come up with my own and that's the first song on really relevant that i came up with when i actually got a bass but the uh getting the bass that was a whole a whole nother thing because i actually had a guitar first and i played right around the same same time i got a guitar first and uh the guitar ended up getting taken away from me um uh to make a long story short and so I I became like driven to get a bass that I saw every day on the way to school in the school bus. I see a bass, a green hollow body Greco bass in the window at a, in a pawn shop on the way to school, Mid City Alternative, Adams and Arlington. And so I like I I used to sell guinea pigs. I used to raise and sell breed and sell guinea pigs. And else I'd take the bus to El Segundo. I would sell comic books, you know, go to uh, Old Town Malls and, and Downey and, and uh, you know, so, and uh, I got some help from my moms and I uh, got that base. And 
I just put myself in the room. I, I live in South Central. I was, uh, they used to call you homie if you stayed. It, it didn't mean you were cool. It meant you stayed in the house and you you, you, weren't, you didn't come outside. You know, you weren't cool. You he's a homie. <laughs> you were just a homie. That was cool. <laughs> yeah, a homebody, but they call you home, homie. That's, <clears throat> that's what they called you, uh, homie. And they, it didn't mean like, oh, yeah, he's my friend. Now it means he's my friend, but back then it means homie. You mean stay, you're a homebody, like you said. <laughs> So, yeah, I used to stay. I was a homebody. I stayed in the house and practiced from sun up to sundown. You know, I started practicing how to sing, be able to sing and play at the same time when when I started playing, and you know, just figuring out everything that I, like every bass line that blew me away. I just wanted to figure it out. Like I did, just <laughs> like Jocko Pistorius. I was like figuring out like really complex stuff and practicing to a metronome you know, all the time for hours. It was just like a magical realm that opened up. The more I played and practiced and discovered, it just like opened and continues to open and unfold. I got my bass right next to me. I'm, a, you know, I, I practice every day still, you know, so that's why this homie, uh, you know, I, I'm used to being a homie and being resourceful and, and you know, um, it, under our, uh, are in our current current atmosphere in in our environment with uh quarantines and and all all the stuff i'm kind of i'm used to that and i've been staying productive and playful which is what i started how i started doing and which is what i love is the play aspect of playing to play any instrument is play involved first off is play if you, if I'm playing anything, I'm playing, I'm playing first. So I love that aspect, and that's what I've been accessing. That's the magical realm, is what I'm discovering. Is just play, simply is realm to opening a whole new, alternate universe, alternate universe. Definitely a universe that you have created. You know, you're the master of your own fate and the captain of your ship. So you come from a musical family as well. I know that your brother is a, is a guitarist, and you guys had a band actually together. Martial Law uh, had a, 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 a deal with Island Records back in the day before you started Weapon of Choice. And right around the time you started Weapon of Choice, he was kind of heading out to work with Red Hot Chili Peppers, and later he was in Macy Gray's band. What was it like in the early days of kind of working together and building Martial Law, and then how did that kind of lead you into Weapon of Choice? Oh yeah, that's my brother Arik, Arik the Freak, uh, guitar. He's two years younger than me, uh, even though he's uh, several inches taller than me. Um, <laughs> so people usually think I'm the little brother. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's my uh, younger brother, and he, you know, he saw me practicing and and playing and and uh, learning, and so you know he was interested he was he can't he would come in while i was practicing and at, he asked me to show him some things so i showed him some chords and how to hold his hands and you know some basic uh technique and you know he would he would he would he would come kept coming in so uh at one point he came in and uh i gave i, I said well take this book and learn the chords in this in this book you know, I didn't. I didn't mean like in one one day, but that's what he. That's what he did. He went in the other room and learned all the chords in the book in one in one day, pretty much from wow. for hours. You know, so uh, and then we started playing together and um, putting songs together. We put martial law together because we had, we had songs. You know, we would play and just make up songs that were like funny to us you know but a big part of it was like something that was funny even if it's a music a riff or something it you know i like a certain element of some something funny even if it's like not something that's un, unexpected you know it's like some element of humor even in the music not necessarily the lyrics but the lyrics also to have a element of humor um 
in whatever form, whether it be sarcasm or absurdity or, you know, or just playful. Yeah, and I was influenced by a lot of different music. You know, I live, I grew up before I started playing, living in an apartment in uh, 50th and Main in South Central, and there were diff- different ethnic music that I would hear blasting from every every apartment around me. So, you know, it's like when you hear music through the wall, you don't know where the one is. So you hear it in a completely different way, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but so I was hearing that from several different uh, areas in my environment, and and to me that the musical uh, output, as well as the vibrational altogether, the experience of of, re, of reality of growing up in South Central, and one of my first images was a military with guns in in the uh in South Central in my neighborhood, like right you know, right down the street from me. And uh that was one of my earliest Im- image images. So I knew this was a nutmeg world when I got here. That was when, that was when I was real young. So it's like I I uh felt like I was uh you know, I was here I asked to be here somehow and I have to figure out and discover what it is that I'm here for. So through play, I've been able to teach youth from South Central all over LA and have them present their art and music at House of Blues, Getty Villa, uh, Hammer Museum, Grammy Museum, all over, all over LA through sharing, you know, and I, it all came from when I started playing bass <clears throat> Just uh, loving the play aspect of it, especially when my my brother, the me and him began to interact musically. You know that play is my favorite thing is to play and jam. As you as you you're aware of by uh, with the funky uh, Fridays era and experience. Oh yeah, man, that which you're a part of. We got a lot of play uh, play out there. Speaking of playing. So just to give you all the praise, I like to toss the flowers where people are still with us. And so you performed alongside members of Peacefront, Fishbone, and Julio de Gracias with Norway Fisher at Fishbone. You were the MC and bassist for Daka. For anyone who never heard that band, my cousin Taisha played viola and Daka. I saw you guys play a grand performance. An amazing 65-piece hip-hop orchestra. Uh, love, love their stuff and definitely very diverse and very different representative of the landscape of LA, which you talked about. Then you also recorded and toured with Joe Strummer of The Clash. You actually wrote something on his Earthquake Weather that you played on a song uh, called Boogie With Your Children. And then you've done stuff with Tom Loke and Ice Cube and George Clinton and Saga Delic, Dion Ferris, obviously from Arrested Development, Perry from James Addiction, Les Claypool from Primus, uh, people from Pearl Jam, your brother. You performed with the Chili Peppers and Clinton. At the Grammys in the 90s, you've done stuff with Shaq Khan and Queen Latifah and Corrupt from the Dog Pound and a laundry list of so many amazing, amazing acts. And, and that's a testament to, to being such an amazing uh, player, even voted uh, at one time by Bass Player Magazine as one of the top five funk bases, which is amazing. So how do you feel with all that recognition and just knowing that uh, your playing has touched so many people and has uh, afforded you the opportunity to really be able to to showcase your talent with all, with all of these names that we mentioned. Wow, thank you, bro. Uh, well, I feel completely grateful, most of all, and I feel that um, since play brought me all of that, then that's what I'm inspired to do today. And, you know, does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, kind of, to kind of just capsulate, uh, you know, but the mainly is gratitude, and I feel completely, you know, I, I feel blessed and honored to have played and and been in the presence of uh, many of the people that I've that I've I've gotten to be an experience being in in their realm. It's just been it's it's been incredible, and uh, actually Joe Strummer. Uh, you mentioned from the class. I was like, I've I've gotten to actually play with my 
musical heroes, people that were actually on my wall. Like, you know, I had George, I had P Funk up there, posters, and George Clinton. I had uh, Bootsy. I had uh, The Clash also, <laughs> you know, so. But I, I got an opportunity to uh, play with my heroes, so I feel like I'm like you know I'm like, it's it's invaluable uh, to be able to experience that that type of thing. It's a magical realm to experience a lot of the uh, things that I've experienced and encounter the people that I've encountered. I feel is a magical realm, and the access has all been through play. So it keeps it goes back to play, gratitude and play, and uh, yeah, it's just been amazing. And Joe Strummer actually, he he uh, gave gave us writing that song "Boogie with Your Children." That was the first session I I did with him. Uh, it was I think it was the uh, either the first it was the the first session, um, the first day. He let me uh, do. He like he would come in with a, a cassette tape of uh, of what of it, it just was kind of him mumbling. He would have a lot of lyrics. That he'd kind of like be mumbling, humming, uh, and and he'd be strumming acoustic guitar. And uh, me and Xander and Willie at the time, and then Jack Irons came uh, later, but. Um, uh, we would figure out uh, some type of arrangement and uh, approach. And then, you know, but this one pr- particular song, Boogie With Your Children, uh, basically we just did what we wanted to do. We interpreted his uh, idea on the cassette that he brought in. And um, he let me do whatever I wanted to do. He's, I'm like, I mean, if you listen to that record, I'm just, I'm playing all over the place. I played a lot busier then than I did. You know, I learned <laughs> to get busier, to, to, that I don't have to play busy, you know, after that. But uh, he let me do what I do whatever I wanted to do, basically. And he left uh, verses for me to do a, a duet with him vocally to sing with him. <laughs> on uh you know on the song boogie with your children which is like what am i dreaming this i was like just dreaming stuff like that you know like uh very very uh recent to that you know and um it just all came from just focusing on on play and discipline seeing the progression of a worthy goal I wanted to get better and be able to play with other people. And also I wanted to create and share something, some insight that could help people and heal people like the music that I grew up on did for me. Yeah. And then, you know, as you talk about play, you branched out even outside of music. You had your own uh, public access TV show at one time, Weapon of Choice. The song Nutty Nutmeg Fantasy was adapted and re-recorded by Macy Gray. That was in the movie for Spider-Man and the soundtrack. And then you also played MC Mad, the dance battle MC, in the opening scene of the film Stomp the Yard. <laughs> so did you want to act being from L.A.? Was that something that kind of was a natural extension of the music, or was it more about the music for you? Uh, it was more – it was about the the music – Really, and it's really about the con. Goes back to what you said in the um, in the beginning um, about nutmeg music. You know, I wanted to just be uh, have an alternative space where it can be something that can't be categorized or is a combination of several different things. It's not just one particular thing that's uh, predictable. It's a uh, you know what I mean? And um, so I wanted it to be a broad thing. And, and like part of nutmeg is just like, you know, just being spontaneous. That's, that's a part of it, being open to different things and not be just not be so um, nar- uh, narrow on a particular viewpoint that I don't like when I see an opportunity, uh, someone wants me to act and uh, stop the yard. I didn't know who Chris, the, Chris Brown was 
but uh, the director actually wanted me to play the, the character. Um, he seen, he used to book my, he was uh, into my band he, at uh, Bell College. They had the Kahootek Festival, and he used to book that. And um, he became, this in years, like several years after that, he he was the director of uh, Stomp the Yard with Chris Brown. And uh, he wanted me to play this character. And he wanted me to do whatever I wanted to do. Yeah, that's been a, been a blessing. Like, I mean, that came from play, too. Every, literally everything, even that, came from playing. And I, I was also on the uh, Bette Midler um, TV show, and I wrote a rap for Bette Midler that we both performed on the TV show. Did you Did you know that one? I had also heard that. Uh, that's cool too i mean that's an amazing amazing star of screen and and music and very well outspoken i could see that being really cool yeah that was amazing too like so and that and i was introduced uh to that because tony basil used to come see our band weapon of choice nice. at the temple bar a lot and tony basil was like a legendary influential Dance choreographer, artist. Yeah, Mickey, you're so fine. Mickey, yep, yeah, and she did that. Mickey, you're so fine, and she was in the uh, L.A. Lockers too, the original Pop Lockers. You can see, you can see her on Soul Train, and a bunch of stuff. But she used to direct uh, videos. Chore- she choreographed uh, one of Fishbone's videos too, I think. Um, I think a problems arise. She did that one. Wow. And uh, she did uh, David Byrne, uh, Talking Heads, the uh, plan of good things go by. When he's doing that on to his arm, you know, that like chop, chop on his arm. Mm-hmm. She choreographed that one. Nice. She, yeah, she introduced me to, uh, she got me on that, that Bette Midler uh, TV show for that. For that. And I wrote, I wrote a rap for Bette Midler. We both did it. It's on YouTube. You could check that one out, too. And the first line I, I showed Bet that I was writing when we we were on the set, and it was uh, who put the hoe in Hollywood? And she saw <laughs> it, she saw it, she started laughing, and she said, "Yeah, yeah, I love it. Keep going." <laughs> oh yeah, that's taking her back to her bathhouse Betty days. A little racy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's cool. Yeah. So musically now, what are you what are you up to? I know we're all doing the. Uh, we're all homies, as you said, but uh, you've been releasing some new singles under the Little Big Up recently. You sent that stuff over to me. That's great. So how's that been going for you? Oh, uh, that's been going amazing. I've been, it's uh, it's under uh, Meganut mm-hmm. is at, uh, on Bandcamp. It's on Spotify, M-E-G-A-N-U-T. And uh, it's been amazing. It's been, uh, it's been a magical miraculous realm just creating uh cre- the act of creating and playing is like is a magic it's not a trick it's just magic you know that's what I'm, I'm able to experience that and not even just not even for myself to uh for others also as well and especially for others i've just been actually i i'm about to release my 18th song this year that's been written recorded and released in 2020 my 18th song is coming up and i'm going for 20 i got my 18th is coming up on october 30th it's going to be called nice age and i got another one coming in the month of november called mind funk and uh it's going to be, when I get to the number 20, it's going to be another album. I already put out one album with 10 songs the beginning months of this year called Cosmic Relief, Groove Healing and Verbal Remedies. The next one is going to be coming soon. So it's been amazing. Well, that's very prolific during this time. You're definitely maximizing it and taking advantage of the, the situation. I think that's something that all people should inspire to do. Just do your best, do what you can, and, you know, you still have time to sharpen your skills and 
even uh, with social distancing, you know, we have the technology to be able to release uh, new things, and we're glad to hear, and you kind of have a captive audience to listen to it, too, so that kind of works hand in hand. So we always uh, end our session with two rapid-fire questions to all of our guests. Um, what advice would you give someone that's coming up now musically or just starting out? To be playful and unstoppable and disciplined. Do something that you that you may not want to do, like practice, like you love to do it. That's what I heard uh, Mike Tyson said. His uh, his coach told him, or do you know about training? Was do something like you love to do, like you like you hate do, doing, like you love to do it. Practice, and that's it. And when you when it's something that you're unfamiliar with that that means that you're you're growing and learning so uh just uh just be playful and remember that it's play is the operative word in it playing any instrument so i don't i don't know too many uh people that didn't at one point love to play yeah, I mean, you definitely have to have those fundamentals, the practice, that dedicated discipline day in, day out, whether you feel it or not, getting it done. And you look at someone like a Mike Tyson, outside of music, you know, he's had a career where you can knock out someone in 15 seconds of a fight in the first round. <laughs> and the only way to do that, you think, oh, he knocked him out in 15 seconds. It's like, yeah, but that took years of, of practice to be able to, to build up a body and to know uh, you know, the fight technique to be able to do something like that. And I think the same way if you want to knock it out of the park musically, yeah, there is no overnight sensation. There's someone that toiled in the night uh, to be able in the daylight to be uh, so prolific. That definitely comes from practice. Um, even people that are virtuosos or, or kind of have it essentially from, from birth, it still requires practice uh, for everyone. It's a muscle memory and things like that. So what do you want? your musical legacy to be? And I know you got a long road ahead of you, so this might be a question for 30, 40 years from now, but uh, what would you want your, uh, when all of a sudden down your musical legacy to be? That I contributed humor and playful wit and something authentic and original to the world. Excellent. Well said. I mean, I think definitely looking at your long body of work, you know, from your new stuff coming out now to all of the multiple albums you have with Weapon of Choice and everyone that you've touched, you definitely have done that. And I think you definitely carry the torch from, uh, you know, a group like a P-Funk that also uh, injected a lot of humor and nursery rhymes and nonsensical things into a very fun, keeping that aspect of play, costumes, all of that. I think I think all of that's important because uh, it makes people feel a certain way, and that's what people remember the most, the way they felt. And when you're playing and the energy and, you know, in the, in the room and, and how you're feeling about it really kind of translates into the instrument and then out to the audience, and then they're feeling back to you. Uh, so it was so great to talk to you, Lonnie, and be able to catch up. And I love the new stuff that you're sending me, so continue to keep sending me stuff, and we're digging into the old stuff. We'll definitely check out that Bette Midler rap on YouTube because I haven't seen it, but I'm sure that's going to be fun. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, you know, when uh, things kind of clear up, we'll be able to actually catch up. We were going to open for you guys uh, in the earlier part of the year, and I didn't have it, so hopefully we can circle back and, and do something collaboratively together in the new year. Absolutely. Anytime. That's what I'm all about is collaborating. Excellent. Well, we will definitely circle back to you once this is out and done so that you can hear it and give you all the links and everything, and we'll be talking to you real soon. All right. Thank you so much, brother. You have a beautiful rest of the day. You too. Take care. Thank you, Pete. Bye-bye. Thanks again for listening to Deeper Groove, Musicians on Music, hosted by Cliff Beach and sponsored by California Soul Music Record Label. I had a blast talking with bassist Lonnie Marshall about his legendary band, Weapon of Choice, and his new Meganet singles that have been coming out this year in 2020. I'd like to thank him for being on the podcast, as well as our engineer, Tim Hall, at 1192 Studios, for mixing and mastering this recording. If you like what you hear and you want to hear more, you can check us out online at www.californiasolomusic.com forward slash deeper grooves or anchor.fm forward slash deeper grooves. And you can check us out every Tuesday here for more great podcasts. Until then.
stick around. We'll tune in next week.